Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. One month after a baby was murdered following a domestic dispute call, two Prince Albert police officers have been suspended. The Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations say, says 13-month-old Tanner Brass was left in a home after police took his mother into custody for suspected intoxication. The FSIN has been calling for the firing of the officers involved in the February 10th 911 call for not following protocol. They said last week that no welfare check was performed on baby Tanner after officers left. The police service says a charge of second degree murder has been laid against the baby's father. In a news release, police chief Jonathan Bergen stated that based on analysis of the preliminary evidence, the suspensions are warranted. Alberta RCMP and the family of 19 year old Angel Cardinal are asking for the public's health in finding witnesses in her death. On February 26th, Angel was the victim of a hit and run driver just north of Edmonton. APTN's Chris Stewart has that story. Angel Cardinal lost her life just as it was beginning. She had two young children. She volunteered at Crystal Kids, a nonprofit to help kids at risk and seniors. She was the youth center rep at High Level Native Friendship Center. On the morning of February 26, she was walking on Highway 28 and was hit by an oncoming vehicle. The driver fled the scene. Alberta RCMP are looking for witnesses to the accident. We know that uh, an unknown male called 911 to report the incident around 5.22 a.m. using a phone calling app. And we are looking to speak to that individual to get additional details from them. Uh, in the middle of his phone call, the uh, line went dead. Uh, we're also looking to speak to uh, an unknown female that in a dark colored vehicle could have stopped just north of the collision scene and uh, had left just before our officers arrived. Skyling Gladju is Angel's aunt. She is urging anyone with information to come forward to police. There are people out there that know exactly what happened to Angel, you know. She has two young children, two babies that no longer have a mom. And, you know, so I really hope that anybody that has any information, anybody that knows anything, that person that called 911, just find it in their heart to just come forward. On Sunday, a memorial was held at the location of her death. Family and friends gathered to remember and honor Angel's life. We had ceremony, we had prayer, we laid down tobacco, we spoke of memories of her. We shared songs and we just prayed for the answers and, and that her spirit go safely. Anyone with information can call the Morinville RCMP or Crime Stoppers. She was so loving and so encouraging and so supportive of everybody that she loved. And within moments of being around her, she, you'd hear how proud she was of you. We're sure going to miss her. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. To Thunder Bay now. And as we've been reporting, there is increasing criticism of the Thunder Bay Police Service. The OPP and the Ontario Special Investigations Unit have announced criminal investigations into members of the service. The Ontario Civilian Police Commission has also launched another investigation into the chief, or the currently suspended deputy chief, the lawyer for the police service and its administration. In addition to that, numerous human rights complaints have been launched by current and former members of the service, including George Ann Morriso, who is a member of the Thunder Bay Police Services Board. She joins us now from Thunder Bay. Georgia, and thanks so much for being with us here today. Thank you for having me. A confidential report uh, was leaked this week that talking about the need for the reinvestigation of up to 16 more cases. There was talk of 25 cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. So that's over 40 cases now that uh, there's talk that needs to be reinvestigated. Uh, should the families and people of Thunder Bay trust the local police service to do that? Um, I think under the current circumstances, which um, myself and others have gone above and beyond to try and inform the public on, I would say that 
I wouldn't be, I think I would be a hypocrite if I were to, to suggest or, or state that the, you know, the community at large and the family should put their trust in the current, under the current leadership regime um, when it comes to, you know, these reinvestigations, um, but also any, any investigations or any operations at, at this point. Um, you know, we've seen uh, just over the last few months, um, especially as of recent, you know, there are some serious allegations that have, have come out. Um, there are currently two concurrent investigations, one being done by OCPC, um, as well as uh, Ontario Provincial Police um, conducting a criminal investigation into the very body, oversight bodies and individuals that, you know, could essentially be in charge of these reinvestigations and to me that makes absolutely no sense. Do you think there should be an apology to these victims' families for how these cases were handled? Oh, I absolutely, um, you know, that at very least, you know, an apology isn't going to bring people back, right? These are family members. However, you know, I think that they're in combination with an apology, I think closure is necessary, justice is necessary, um, you know, and I think given the the position we're in especially as as a board and as the the various oversight bodies in ontario um you know and the senior senior leadership we are in a, in a position to to do something and to act if we don't it's because we don't want to and i think that needs to be very very clear to to the public and to these families is we have an opportunity to act this is another opportunity to set the record straight, to be able to bring closure to these families, to meaningfully engage and acknowledge what has transpired and what has happened throughout this process. It's it's grueling to say the least. And, um, you know, again, just, just going back on the, the recent statements coming out and explanations, I just think that, you know, it's um, it's a slap in the face, to be honest, because I don't think that that's, that's appropriate. Uh, Georgia, and as you know, uh, the Deputy Grand Chief of Anishinaabe Aski Nation, Betty Ann Anthony Paneskum, has added her name to the list of people who believe the Thunder Bay Police Service should be disbanded. Uh, what are your thoughts on shutting down the Thunder Bay Police Service? You know, it's never, you know, we're not here because we want to be here. You know, we don't speak and say these things for solely for the sake of saying it. There is a real there are real issues and, and concerns here, and there's there's a real crisis going on um, here in Thunder Bay. And I think we have a job and a duty to do something about it, and that's 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 where we're at. So Deputy Grand Chief Anna Betty, you know, coming out with her with her comments, absolutely. I support it. That's 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 the last resort, but that's the last resort we're being met with and, and where we're at. Because currently if things aren't working. And we can only media release ourselves out of this and deflect and deflect as much as possible. But all that does is it just makes the problem worse, doesn't address, address the core issues of, you know, lack of leadership, corruption. Um, you know, I mean, there is so much that is, that is happening here. How do we expect to see a level of service and a standard of service that so often between the, the chair and the, the police services board, as well as the chief of police often tout off about when in, in their faces, their own service members are chastising and criticizing the same things. Why are we ignoring this? It's not okay. And so something drastic needs to happen and it has to be more than just another oversight body or another oversight individual as an administrator. I agree with those need to happen, but there needs to be a true path forward in terms of sustainable accountability, meaningful accountability, because right now that is severely lacking. And I believe that is a lot to do with why we as a board, and again, I'm not speaking on behalf of any other board members, I'm speaking on behalf of my own experience, but we as a board you know, seem to be able to to operate and do as, you know, as, as we please without any degree of accountability or having to be accountable for, for such. Georgia, and we'll have to leave it there. Lots, no doubt, to talk about. Uh, appreciate mm -hmm. you taking some time for us today. I really appreciate it, and thank you for your time today as well and raising light to these issues. Well, it's now been exactly two years 
since an international pandemic was declared. We'll look back and ahead after the break. Welcome back. Before COVID-19, a break in Parliament often meant cabinet ministers coming north to announce projects. Now they usually do it virtually and that's how they did it today. Minister of Northern Affairs Dan Vandell logged on from Manitoba to announce just over $2 million in funding for seven, seven different Nunavut communities. The funding is for local infrastructure. One of the communities to receive funding is Taliyok, one of Nunavut's most western communities. They will use the money to build a food centre and soup kitchen, which the community's mayor says is sorely needed. Well, I can't stress how, how much we need this soup kitchen here. Um, it will give us access to a food bank as well. Our employment rate here in Taliyok is very low. And, uh, it's uh, very, very few jobs here. Well, it's been exactly two years since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 an international pandemic. With vaccinations on the rise and infections starting to drop, a number of provinces are loosening restrictions. This includes Ontario, where most masking restrictions will be lifted on March 21st. Northern Ontario First Nations are remaining careful. APTN's Fraser Needham reports. Bearskin Lake First Nation was hit hard by the Omicron variant. Declared a state of emergency in early January. Infections in the community reached over 50 percent. Chief uh, Lefty Kamen Wadaman says things have improved message, drastically. And there are currently no infections. However, he says his community like remains community. cautious. From a community standpoint, uh, for us in is uh, too soon. Like... Um, Right now, I'm. We're still uh, trying to encourage and be diligent, uh, diligent, I guess, uh, with mask wearing. Dr. Lloyd Douglas if says there are currently 385 active COVID cases across the 31 First Nations served by the Sioux Lookout Health Authority, and majority of those communities remain on lockdown. Dr. Douglas says the pandemic is not you know, over like in the north. For us in the north, the pandemic is not over. Um, when we look at our epidemiological curve, that's the number of cases over time. We are right at the very top of the mountain right now, and we're hoping that it doesn't go higher. We haven't started to come down just yet. We're hoping that we will be coming off that peak. But the truth is that we have several communities that have not yet been hit by Omicron. And we are still concerned about communities with lower vaccine coverage rates. Meanwhile, further south in Ottawa, one of the main organizations that serves the Inuit community says it has been monitoring things closely. Amanda Killebuck says Tungasavengat Inuit will be keeping restrictions in place for the time being. We are basing our decision on what works for us. I can't necessarily comment on um, the province's decision or how they came to that decision. Um, I'm not privy to, to those discussions, but um, for TI, um, we, we discussed as a management team um, that we will uh, continue to mask until further notice. Ontario says it plans to move toward lifting all COVID-19 restrictions by the end of April. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Still to come, an exciting new opportunity for Indigenous entrepreneurs. Stick around. Welcome back. Time now to take a look at our photo of the day. APTN National News' very own Jared Delorme took this uh, shot while visiting Toronto of the uh, 3D sign located at Nathan Phillips Square in downtown Toronto. Well, you're out and about this weekend. Take some pictures and email them to share at aptn.ca for our next, for a chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Saturday's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 12 above in Halifax, plus 1 in St. John's. 
Minus 16 for Nain. 13 below in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Minus 3 in Montreal. Snow and 6 below for Shibugamu. Minus 11 with snow in Sault Ste. Marie. 8 below in North Bay. Minus 9 in Thunder Bay. Minus 12 for Sioux Lookout. Minus 10 with snow in God's Lake. 11 below and flurries in Norway House. Snow in Winnipeg and minus 7. 0 with snow in Brandon. Plus 2 for Regina. Plus 2 in Saskatoon with snow. 0 in Meadow Lake. Minus 6 with snow in La Ronge. Over in northern Alberta, minus 7 with snow in Fort McMurray. Plus 4 for Grand Prairie. 5 in Edmonton. 8 in Lethbridge. Plus 10 for Vancouver and Victoria. Plus 4 in Prince George. 0 for Dees Lake. Minus 20 in Old Crow, 4 below with snow for Whitehorse. Minus 19 and snow in Yellowknife, 18 below in Norman Wells. Minus 28 in Saks Harbor, 24 below in Politak. Minus 28 in Chesterfield, 27 below in Baker Lake. Minus 26 with snow in Resolute, 31 below with snow in Joe Haven. Twenty twenty one was the first year Canada officially recognized September thirtieth as the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. Though only federal regulated employees were guaranteed the day off. Now the Yukon is the first province or territory taking steps to make September thirtieth a holiday for everyone. The territory has launched an online survey for Yukoners and businesses to provide feedback on making September thirtieth a new general holiday. Employees regulated by the Yukon Employment Standards Act are not currently entitled to the holiday or pay in lieu. Public input is positive. An amendment would be made to the act so more employees can observe the day. Community Services Minister Richard Mostyn says reshaping the holiday would make it fair for all. Calls to action. It's important for the people of the territory to, to actually come to grips with uh, our history in Canada. The Manitoba government has also said it will consider making September 30th a statutory holiday for non-federally regulated employees. A new TV show that will air on APTN in the fall of 2022 is now shooting episodes that feature entrepreneurs who pitch their businesses to some of Canada's elite Indigenous business leaders. APTN's Tina House explains it's a uh, reality TV with a real impact. Roll camera! Come on, Roy. Mark it. Sarah Beth, pre pitch, episode three, take one. 18 people hey, from all across Canada have flown to Vancouver to beyond the Bears' lair. They get the chance to pitch to a panel of judges their businesses. Out of the 18 pitches, six of those will win $10,000. Those six semi-finalists will then go on to the final episode where one business will win $100,000. Gina Jackson is the executive producer of the new series Bears Lair. She says after watching how the Dragon's Den and Shark Tank was, she knew that she could do something more specific to Indigenous businesses. And what's different on her show is that they do not take any ownership of any product. She says the vast array of businesses vying for the cash prizes are inspiring. We're really excited. We've got a canine unit, security. We've got uh, a baker. We've got health and wellness. We've got so many different entrepreneurs that have such different aspirations and dreams. But the commonality between this is that they're all giving back to their community. They're giving, they've produced products or goods or services that provide health and wellness, that provide protection, that bring their members and their communities rising up. The location and set was designed and built by Gina's talented brother, Shane Jackson, who transformed his workspace into a TV set. Episode 3C, take 3. We caught up with a few of the entrepreneurs making their pitches. I developed my love for the forest when I used to take walks with my mother. Matricia Bauer has a bitters company. 
I hope to uh, indigenize uh, one kitchen at a time. <laughs> and I'd like to elevate um, bitters to something that isn't just for cocktails or mocktails, but that's also incorporated into tea. So it is a flavor profile. So I'm gonna try and make it into like a regular condiment. I fed 1,000 meals to our homeless population. Ellie Herbacek is a baker with her own unique style. I do um, creative, unique, artistic um, cakes, cookies, and cupcakes, and I like to do out of the out of the box kind of edible treats. Uh, either use float planes, full planes, or even drones. Benjamin uh, Fegan and his fiance have found a way to solve food security for remote communities. So we're growing uh, three different categories of foods: uh, fresh produce, which includes leafy greens culinary herbs, and some small fruiting crops like cherry tomatoes and fairy tale eggplant. Um, we're intending to be able to distribute throughout all of northwestern Ontario, serving both our roadway and far north communities with specific en emphasis on our Indigenous community members. Dave Tuckero is no question one of the top so Indigenous businessmen in Canada. His vast array of businesses have brought in millions of dollars in revenue over the years. He says it's about time this type of show was created. A show like this, uh, you know, you got guys like me who've been through the ringer already and uh, understand how to do business with big corporations and small ones. Uh, but we have the experience and we have some knowledge now and we have, you know, we, we could actually pass that on to some of these younger entrepreneurs coming forward. Another judge is Robert Louis. He has been in business for over 30 years as well. He has some advice for success. You've got to find the, uh, the creative ways that you can uh, adapt, adapt with the environment, uh, uh, adapt with regulatory changes, uh, uh, look at the uh, social conscience of the consumers. All of that, I think, uh, plays a part. After the season finale, Bears Lair community members will have four weeks to vote online to award four runner-ups to win $5,000 each. And Gina says for those that don't win, there will be continued support ongoing. The show is just a platform. Coming and getting um, information, the BearsLairTV.com is going to have information on grants for Indigenous women, for elders, for youth. It's going to be your resource with all our, our fine sponsors um, that have supported this program to, to help out entrepreneurs, and, that, and that's my passion. So this is my why. Tina House, APTN National News, North Vancouver. And cut. Looks like a great show. Excited to see that this fall. Well, that's all the time we have for your AP10 National News for this Friday. For news anytime or more on any of the stories you've seen here, visit our website, aptnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.